Welcome to The Passion Pod with your host, Chris Johnson. Thanks for joining us. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy the feature presentation. Season 8, Episode 2. Welcome back, friends. Today, we travel to Los Angeles to chat with a young business mind. Our guest today is an entrepreneur in every sense of the word. I met him on a previous trip out here when myself and alumni of the show J-Rap went out for beers in Hollywood and knew I had to interview him in the future. Six months later, here we are. Welcome to the show, Rohan K. Taylor. Thanks for having me, my man. Dude, we're in Hollywood. I feel like such a badass right now. And with your, your, your glasses and your hat, all your branding, you look kind of outdoing me. That's all right. I'll make it. So who are you and what are you passionate about? Uh, so my name is Ron K. Taylor, uh, originally from Texas, and I'm, I guess I'm passionate about clothing, but honestly, uh, probably on like a deeper level, some more stuff about like, um, I'd say mindset and also just kind of thinking it like, as for, how do I explain? Basically like a different way of thinking or a new paradigm, a way sure. of thinking versus to just like clothing. And I kind of like to interpret that and I like to empower creatives, basically make creatives have a way to make their creativity whatever they're doing their full-time thing yeah dude yeah. that's well and that's exactly what the show is about really right is to inspire people to think about the things they're passionate about and help them find ways to incorporate those passions into their lives theoretically as a career ideally right because that's how you can put the most amount of time into it to gain the most fulfillment of um so how can people best follow you see the things that you make see your work and get in contact if they wanted to um best way honestly is just through my personal um at rohan k taylor you guys are more than welcome to reach out shoot me a message whenever sometimes i may not see it but I, I tend to get back to everyone as long as it's like a quality question of course and uh yeah yeah i mean if anyone just hits me up and just says hey i yeah. don't i don't bother that either just because there's so much no. spam and shit it's kind of like ask me something legitimate and like totally cool like yeah I, I'll, I'll find time when i'm done with whatever i'm not that incredibly busy of, of a person now if you want to like have a continuous conversation that's not going anywhere I might cut you off after a minute of course, of where course, I'm like, I don't have limitless time, you know, like I, I've had people before be like, hey, man, can I call you? And I'm like, well, about what? Mm -hmm. I just want to chat. No, not, <laughs> I'm not trying to be a dick. I'm sure you're great. Yeah. But like what if you have a question, hit me up. Um, OK, so you said you're from Texas. Where are you from in Texas? Uh, originally from the Dallas Fort Worth area, um, really Fort Worth, Fort Worth slash Keller area. That's where it's classified as. Sure. What kind, how big of a city is that? Honestly, man, I don't know the population off the top, but I knew a lot of the people in my town. I, I don't know if it's a small or the same same size, similar to where you're from, but oh. I'd say it's actually a pretty growing, it's a decent city, but I mean, I know basically everyone there. Like when I go home, I go to Walmart and I know I run into someone I know or like I go somewhere, but it's actually growing a lot. And it's actually, every time I go back, I feel like I run into less and less people I know, maybe because I graduated high school and everybody's in college and people are finishing up college, you know what I mean? But yeah. Um, for the most part, I mean, it's a pretty small town. It's like a suburban town, just a ton of houses, ton of neighborhoods. Um, good area though. Um, everyone was basically middle-class. Like it wasn't very, I feel like in LA, it's like, you're the really rich, you're in the penthouse or you're like struggling artists, like in Hollywood or not Hollywood, sorry, like K-Town or something like that, or just yeah. somewhere where you're just trying to like figure it out. It's like very, there's not too many people that are in the median and people that are in the median, they don't even own a house. But in Texas, if you're just working a job and you have like a career, you can afford a house or like afford to have someone for you. Like all my homies had houses, no matter what their parents did. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, compared to LA where it's like, you know, if your mom works at the school or something, she's a teacher, like you're probably living in an apartment. You know what I mean? Yeah. If you're, if, especially if you're in the city, maybe if you go out to like Santa Clarita or whatever, but still like those houses are like half a million bucks. You Dude, know it's I mean? just a crazy different lifestyle. Like my yeah. town, there's 60 some thousand. So I'm sure it's smaller than where you're from. Right? It's about, actually, it's about the same. I think, I think where I'm from is like 80,000. So oh, okay. Yeah, actually, yeah. yeah. And, and it is like, it is a growing spot. We're 90 miles east of Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. So it's not really that far from like a big city, which is dope because then realistically, how often do you? want to go out to something that only a big city has like events and stuff it's not like you're doing that all the time mm -hmm. you know what i mean so driving an hour and a half is dude takes an hour and a half to get across town here anyway sometimes so it's really not a big deal but yeah i own a skateboard shop and off of that and it's not like this high profile spot it's mm -hmm. small and i can afford a house mm -hmm. you know i mean not like i have a ton of extra income but you can actually make it happen that way and i'm like a crazy townie I, my parents bought a house there i actually bought the house i grew up in wow which is kind of crazy um, when i got divorced i bought that house and it's like the best thing ever but my parents bought that house when i was two i'm 31 
And I moved around a little bit. I spent a year in Minneapolis area. I spent a year up in Duluth, Minnesota. But otherwise, I've been there. Mm -hmm. So like, I really know everyone. And then I opened my shop when I was 23. So seven and a half years ago, I opened a store downtown. I'm involved in a lot of stuff. I'm a city official now. I'm on the Parks wow. and Waterways Commission with my city. So I do shit that way. I mean, you know, I'm on two radio stations. I really know everybody. It's like everywhere yeah. I go, I know people. And it's like, to me, I actually really like that. You know, I just feel kind of like safe. You know what I mean? Like everyone's friendly. I don't That's feel amazing. like there's anybody that like has the wrong interests out there or whatever. That's amazing. Um, so where, when, is, when did clothing like become a thing? When did you cognizantly be like, I care about what I'm wearing? Um, I would say that's actually an interesting question because I, when I was in middle school, I've kind of always had this entrepreneur spirit. Um, when I was in like intermediate school, I used to sell candy and like kind of like the, you know, the, the, the story, you know, I started selling candy, whatever. Then in middle school, I started selling reselling sneakers. And at the time, I wasn't really popular. I kind of got bullied like growing up until I'd say like maybe like mid high school, like 10th, 11th grade. And um, <clears throat> it wasn't until middle school to where I started to have um, all these cool shoes. Like I basically had my own sneaker reselling business and I had it in a way where I was buying a lot of used shoes so I could buy a used shoe and then wear it maybe once or twice and then sell it and still make money. And like I was just kind of rotating that. So I'd have like 20 kicks in my collection, making extra money, but then every day I'd come to school with a new pair of shoes. So that kind of made me like the cooler guy. But if you have a cool pair of shoes, but a whack outfit, it's like, what's the point, you know? Right. And uh, I think just over time, uh, whenever I got into high school, the stinker game started changing a little bit. Um, I kind of like, I still was interested and still loved what I, still loved it. But at the same time, I was like, eh, like, I don't know. I wanted to create something of my own. So um, I ended up creating a brand originally called RKT, which is my initials, and uh, kind of just sold stuff in school, became really popular in my area, and uh, a year after I graduated, I worked, saved some money, and I moved to LA, and then it's a whole thing from there. I can go on a whole tangent, but I don't want to, we'll go, we can go step by step. <laughs> yeah, 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 we'll, so. we'll get to it. Um, okay, well, so right, as of right now, just, and this is an annoying thing, because when you go to parties, you go to events and stuff, immediately people ask you, like, what do you do? And it, it's normally kind of annoying to even tell people, because mm -hmm. whatever. And especially when you're an entrepreneur, you do a lot of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you have your own brand, but you're printing things for other people, but mm -hmm. then you're also working things on social media, and you're creating things and whatever. But in general, what currently is kind of encompassed within your career? Um, I would say it's all apparel-based. I mean, it's all through clothing. Um so like if I'm at a party or something and somebody's like, what do you do? I'm like, I do apparel. And then I usually go on a whole tangent. But it kind of depends on the person I meet, honestly. So say if I meet someone who has a clothing brand, I'm like, oh, I do manufacturing. I do design and whatever, whatever. This is that. But then if I'm meeting an influencer who may want some cool dope clothes, I'm like, oh, well, I'm the creative director for 369. So it kind of just depends on what situation I'm in. I'm kind of situational with it. And then obviously, if I become close to someone like I'm close with j -Rap, I'll, they know who I am and like what I do and um, just like I'm still kind of like figuring out what's the exact goal I've definitely seen a lot of growth and I've been able to do this full time for the last let's say year year and a half which has been a huge blessing and amazing um, but it hasn't I don't really know a title for me and I don't know if I will have a title I think I said long term I would want to help creatives empower themselves or like create you know their own stream of income from what they do um, but I'm not sure how to categorize that position, you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, I guess apparel is like my, my, my rocket ship and I love clothes. I love making clothes. I love coming up with cool designs. I love coming up with cool ideas for other people. I love incorporating things in other people's life for them. So I would just say apparel. I think sure. apparel is just like my creative outlet for sure. What's the first thing you can remember making? Must've been an RKT <clears throat> thing, right? Yeah, it was an RKT thing. It was, um, I went to this little shop, like in a grocery store plaza right next to this Kroger. And it was like this, like, I don't know what printing was or whatever. So I got these like, I think Gildan shirts and it was like this vinyl, this white vinyl, which is basically just heat ad adhesive onto there. And uh, I did like 12 shirts of this black, it said RKT. And then on, on the back it said ascending. And then I, <clears throat> I went home and I threw bleach on it. So I had like the bleach stains on it. Yeah, And it was actually kind of a cool shirt, but um, the back, a lot of my pieces all have like a backstory. So my name Rohan actually means ascending. Okay. So that's why I put the ascending, like going down the back. You know what I mean? You did it vertically? Uh, how very like, it, yeah, like ascending, yeah, okay. like ascending up. So, sure. um, almost all, everything I make actually has like some kind of backstory or some kind of like thing. Maybe people may not realize it, but to me it has that. And I feel like over time I want 
people who like really are interested to like kind of do their research and like oh shit like yo he did this you know what i mean yeah i don't know can i, I don't know if i can cuss yeah yeah yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. If, okay. if it's f words we got to take it out for the radio okay, otherwise okay. you're good okay all right okay i won't say that. <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah so no um i'd say all my pieces um yeah that was like the first piece i made for sure cool cool so what what did you did you buy a heat press thing for it or mm -hmm. like how did how did you start making things beyond that? Like when I was growing up, I was in print graphics class in, mm -hmm. in high school, so I made T-shirts and stuff too. Um, but all that equipment was just there, which was super dope because um, my teacher at the time, Al Willett, he basically said like, if you're working on stuff, I don't care what you're working on. Oh, that's so amazing. like we had certain things we we're supposed to do really for the curriculum, but he didn't really care. So I kind of just made a bunch of bootleg skate shirts and stuff over the years, which is cool. I made that's these sick. t shirts. Um, I actually just got one. This is a crazy story. Um, I made these t shirts a long time ago. They were black. I just mm -hmm. did this basic design that said build us a park already. Mm -hmm. And then it had the old skateboard shop that used to exist called uh, it was called Underloud. It had that on it. And I donated those to the skateboard shop. This was when I was like 14, 15, probably 15. Mm -hmm. And uh, we sold them at the skateboard shop <laughs> to raise money for a new skate park in our town. Right. Mm -hmm. So that was the first like actionable thing I did for the skateboarding scene in my city. Recently, I'm talking like a few months ago, one of these shirts popped up on our local vintage shops, Instagram. Wow. And I was like, oh, my God. That's so I immediately sick. tried to get a hold of them, whatever. My employee got to my store and I like rushed down there. Man, I must have only made a dozen of these. Mm -hmm. And this is 16 years ago. That's crazy. And this random Gildan T-shirt popped <laughs> up. Literally, like I got there. She handed me the shirt shit you not just start crying i was like my entire life was has been this like this is the first thing i did that my whole life followed afterwards you know and actually just recently the parks we've been raising money for this whole time we just finally got approved by our city council unanimous unanimously a week unanimously a week ago um 200 grand to finally wow. get a real skate park in our city that's amazing. this many years later that's beautiful and, dude. and you found the shirt a yeah months ago that's insane yeah so that's going to be framed now i gotta get a like poster frame and stuff that's for my beautiful. house um so did you have access to that stuff in high school or how did you even do the heat tra the heat press thing in the first place for those shirts was it like an iron yeah, so honestly, I mean, I, I I think I still do have the shirt. I keep like one piece of everything I've made, at least like that's on tight. on the back burner. Um, but that's beautiful, man. It's it's funny. It's almost like Gildan makes dreams, you know. Yeah. It's like the standard, and people look like kind of talk down upon it. But I mean, honestly, bro, it's a great starting place. I mean, yeah. I think the hardest thing is to just get started. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I think people can clown on other people for just getting started, and I used I had that situation as well when I started my stuff. Yeah. But I'm sorry, what was your question? Again? Well, so I was asking how you were making stuff, but really like that, that really is with anything we talk about yeah. on the show. A lot of times, the hardest mm -hmm. thing is taking that first step mm -hmm. because you know, you're going to be embarrassed by it. You know, you're not going to be good, by, good at it. So like having that confidence to be okay with being ridiculed, be okay, knowing that the first thing you do isn't going to be good. It's like when we were talking with J rap about doing podcasts, mm -hmm. the first episode you're going to record is probably not going to be good. In fact, if you look, go back and look at the very first episode I did with uh, my friend, Miles Boulevard, who's like a local rapper in my city. Dude, we re-recorded that three times. Mm -hmm. Like I came wow. back. The one that actually came out, I yeah. re-recorded like <clears throat> after I'd done more episodes because the first one wasn't good. Mm -hmm. And I just didn't want that to be out there in the of first course. place because I'm like, it's not good. But taking that first step is really the difficult part. So anyways, what I was asking was how you started making stuff because you said you bought like a heat press thing. I don't know if it was just an iron on situation or from then you're still in high school, right? So this is before you came out here. How did you kind of start building the brand? How did you, How are you even making the products in the first place? Yeah, so um, I started off, like I said, that little shop on right by the grocery store. I think they just had a vinyl cutter, which is like this little thing. You can get a creek cut or a, um, I used to have it. I can't think of it, but it's just a little like vinyl cutter. And basically it's just material and it's a little knife and it cuts out the design. Then you peel it off and then you just press it onto a shirt and it sticks. Um, so that was my first one. Then my second one, I did a screen print design and I did it from this uh, one place in in Texas, I forgot what it was called. It was just like some normal screen printing place. I got like, I think 24 shirts made or like, I got like half green, half white. I, I remember this, I remember the design, but actually I completely forgot I even got stuff made there. But then at the same time, I became good friends with my, I became good friends with this kid whose dad owned a screen printing company. Oh. So he started making my stuff and he was like my main guy. And he's the one that kind of even, I, I finally understood manufacturing after going to him. Yeah. Or at least I got a, brief understanding because i got to see it being made i got to see the equipment and stuff like that so that was an amazing thing he's a really nice guy i actually still work with him today he's a partner for my company now funny enough um but yeah so i think that's just how i started i just kind of 
I mean, even now, if I like can't do something, I find a, even if I don't know if there's a way, I'll still say I can do it. And I usually end up making it happen. You know what I mean? Yeah. Were you able to use then like the footwear like thing? You're selling mm -hmm. shoes. Is that how you kind of made the money in the very first initial couple hundred dollars you needed to make these shirts and stuff? And then you just kind of flip that money back into the business. Is that kind of how it works? That's exactly what happened. Yeah. So I had that. And then I also, well, when I was like 15 or 16, I worked at Sprouts. I don't know if you know what Sprouts is. No. It's like a Whole food. It's like a... It's like in between a Whole Foods and a uh, Albertsons. It's like a, a co-op type grocery store. Yeah, it's like a organic but not yeah. super bougie grocery store. Sure, I like okay. push carts there. And then I worked at Best Buy and I was like a customer service specialist. Sure. I was a cashier. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so um, I did that and I just kind of worked into that. And then um, actually after high school, I ended up working at Honda. I did really well there. And, and I kind of just kind of do the – honestly, I really do the never – I always make clothes, but I didn't really take it serious until I think, not even when I moved out here. I mean, I would kind of make stuff here and there, but it wasn't until I'd say like the last year and a half, two years where I really started to take it serious. So you moved out to LA. How old were you? 19? Right. A year after high school? I was 19 when I moved out here. Yeah. Which means you're only like 21. 22. Yeah. Damn. I got <laughs> yeah. almost a decade on you. Okay, cool. <laughs> so you were working at Honda before you moved out there selling mm -hmm. cars? Selling cars. Okay. Yeah. And then when you moved out here, did you already have, I guess, what was the situation? Did you have like a little security net? Did you have a room with some friends and a job lined up? Or like, what was that situation like? I didn't know anyone here. I knew a, f a, f a friend from high school his dad was in a frat with a guy who lives in LA. And that was the only guy I knew. <clears throat> cool. And I'm very grateful for him. I love that guy. I actually just saw him for the first time in a long time, uh, maybe two weekends ago. And it was so good seeing him because, like, a lot of things we talked about are like things that he said that, like, we're going to end up happening, like, ended up happening. So cool. it was great seeing him. Um, cool. But yeah, I didn't know anybody, man. I didn't know. I just knew that guy. He had kids, but, like, we didn't really connect that. I mean, we connected. They were similar in age, but. We didn't, they weren't like homies, you know, they weren't sure. friends. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I didn't know anyone out here, man. I just moved out here, um, stayed at a hostel in an Airbnb, which is like a bunk bed thing, but I actually made yeah. some really cool friends. I'm actually going to Europe, um, at the end of the year. And, uh, one of my friends is out there from that. I met through the hostel. What part of Europe are you going to? Uh, I'm going to Copenhagen and okay. Amsterdam. Cool. And maybe maybe other places too. I'm not really sure yet. I was just in Amsterdam. Really? Yeah. And the guest <sighs> that I had on earlier today, Salon, she grew up in Amsterdam her whole wow. life, like all the way through college. She's from Amsterdam. I gotta be there then, man. Dude, Salon. it's tight. I actually got all the really brief story is I got stuck there. Mm -hmm. I went to Croatia <laughs> by myself wow. and got COVID over there. Oh shit. And then got stuck. Oh, and no. then when I finally got, so I had to quarantine over there with the Red Cross. And then when I finally got the okay to go, my connecting flight was in Amsterdam and they wouldn't let me get on my connecting flight. Wow. So I got stuck in Amsterdam for an extra day, which was fine. I yeah, had a good yeah, time. Of course, you know, of I had a full 24 hours. So I went out and like drank and it had, yeah, had my fun <laughs> and stuff in Amsterdam. So, so yeah, so that's yeah, tight. I actually sick. stayed too in, in, uh, I was looking for a cheap place to stay. So it's expensive to stay out here. And, mm -hmm. and that's why like I have a Patreon and stuff for my show. It's like mm -hmm. people, I do have that conversation with people once in a while where people are like, oh, what do you mean? Like, I thought you do it for the, you know, because you're passionate mm -hmm. about it. I'm like, well, I, I am passionate about it, mm -hmm. but it is very expensive of to create. And you're mm -hmm. very familiar with that as well. Yep. Like there has to be some mm -hmm. money running through. I just had that conversation with a friend who... Yeah, I'll, we'll talk it's, about that later. Yeah, it's it, it, it's it's just unfortunate, but it, I mean it's all part of it, right? So so, anyways, I was out here on my last trip, um, and I had nowhere to stay mm -hmm. for the last couple of days of it. Um, so, anyways, I ended up getting a pod, like by the airport. Oh, like so I had to sleep in like a little bunk thing or whatever. It wasn't. Exactly. It really wasn't that bad. Yeah. Um, but it, that was the first time I ever had like that kind of experience. So so you moved out here. Did you just find that on like good old Craigslist or Airbnb? You said I Airbnb the hostel. Yeah. How much then, was that? Uh, Do you remember? Maybe like four hundred bucks a month. It was pretty cheap. Oh, that is cheap for out yeah. here. Okay. It was, a, it was a hostel though. Yeah. Like, it yeah, was a shared sure. room with yeah. one, two, three, four other people. It was two bunk beds, and I shared a bathroom, and I had like a little. Excuse me, a little locker. Yeah. I mean, I had a kitchen. It was a cool place. And the sure, people who lived there yeah. were cool. I actually ran into someone who lived there like um like a, like maybe like two months ago. Cool, cool, cool. Um they were just like in downtown just walking. I was like, What? And did they, you like we like kinda pointed at each other, like, is that you? <laughs> <laughs> so did you did yeah. you come here with like a thousand dollars or something? Like what did you, um, did you have some kind of cushion I, to have time to yeah, find a job? Yeah, I had a little bit of money saved up. Um, I had a couple grand saved up just to okay. make sure. Um I didn't really work my first couple months out here. Kind of was just getting acquainted to the city. Um, but then when I s ended up getting a roommate and I was paying a thousand bucks a month, I, I ended up having to work again. So I went and started working at Honda and um, I started working at Honda again and I was selling cars, hated it. But then I went to another dealership, which was nicer and cooler and it paid a little bit more. But um, at the end of the day, I was working a shit ton and I wasn't um, 
getting anything. I wasn't moving forward in the brand. I was just working and living out here. I had my own place and all that. I've been able to transition to that, but I was like, I'm just going home and sleeping and working. Like, and I'm paying a crazy amount for rent. I could have did this in Texas and I was making more money in Texas actually at the Honda. So, um, so yeah, I was doing that on and off. And then, um, I just I honestly did that for on and off. And I, I mean, I could talk forever about my, I've had a crazy LA experience, but it's been very grateful and I've learned a lot. But I mean, I've like not worked for a minute and then I worked and then not worked and this and that. And it wasn't until I'd say like COVID hit and then I kind of got let go for a little bit. I started to really tap in with it myself. And I mean, I can't really get distracted by the parties and stuff because everything was closed, you know. So uh, I started locking on my business and saw exponential growth. And um, it's been a blessing. And I've been able to really achieve all the things that I've like set for myself from moving out here. So now I'm at a point right now in my life where I'm like, OK, well, I got the car. I got the, the dope place, whatever, whatever. I, you know, my business doing this a month or whatever. Now what's next, you know? Sure. And like, are those the things that are important? Is that where I want to stop? Or like, what is the next thing? And I'm, and I'm in that space right now. Yeah. And I think I'm getting closer to figuring that out every day, but it's uh, definitely something that is on my mental every day. But then there's times where I like to disconnect and, and just kind of not think about it and let things in my life happen to go towards that route you know yeah it's it's hard for me anyways i don't know if you feel the same way it's hard for me if i don't feel like i'm working towards something mm -hmm. and that's getting back to what you're talking about with working at um at honda you know it's like i'm so put it this way my last job i had was working for verizon and i it's it actually was really easy and i got paid too much money really but it i felt like i was making the world worse mm -hmm. and i certainly wasn't building anything for myself it, it simply was a paycheck which is okay you know but that's all it was right and then i were you know opened my store when i was 23 i was doing that for a long time my shop hit five years old and i was like okay what's next what's yeah. next what's next gotta find something so i ended up getting just part-time one day a week i was like this will be fun i got a bartending job right Sick. and it was actually tight because it was one day a week my friends would always show up i made good money but what i found was the money was irrelevant to me. Mm -hmm. It was like, this isn't building upon anything. Mm -hmm. And uh, talking about like a personal brand or something, I'm mm -hmm. like, I'm not actually building towards anything at all outside mm -hmm. of making money. This is, I just don't like it. And that's mm -hmm. when I discovered the show, which the show is kind of like all attached to my brand, to my store, to my art. It's like all kind of, mm -hmm. you know, the same thing. So I was able to build it up. So you're doing the Honda thing. You must have been still selling. Did you, were you selling any clothing out here when you moved out? Yeah, I tried. I mean, I had a website and stuff. Was that still the RKT? Yeah, the RKT. Okay. Um, I didn't rebrand until I'd say COVID. I think I like reevaluated a lot. So what happened? You got laid off. Did you get the unemployment? So you at least had like a little bit of a net there while you like sat and kind of like made a new outline of this is where we're going. Yeah. So it was like a weird thing. So it was basically like we weren't let go, but like everything was closed in California, like closed, closed in yeah. California. So, um, everything was like closed. So I didn't really get let go. It was just, I was on pause. And I think I, I'm pretty, yeah, I was getting paid. I think we were all getting paid on unemployment, but we weren't fired, you know, yeah. we just the dealership just wasn't open, you know? Yeah. Um, and then we started going back, but then we were still, I was going to work, but I was working barely but I was still getting paid like it was unimportant. It was something weird. Honestly, I don't remember. Yeah. I know I was still being able to pay my bills and stuff, so that was okay. Um, but it was actually around that same time that, like, I also just wanted to kind of quit the job. I don't even know. I think I – oh, no, I got fired, actually. Oh, okay. I, yeah, I got fired or let go. One of the – I think I got fired, personally, but I – Whatever, you, however you want to qualify it. Sure. Um, around the same time that like we started going back into work is when my business started to take off, and then I started bringing my laptop to work, and I was working on my business at work, and then, and I was sitting, I was like, dang, I just did all this working with clients, doing printing and stuff, and like I'm, like I don't know why I'm here. You know what I mean? Like I'm making yeah. this hourly or whatever when I'm doing way more just for my computer here. Like I should maybe focus on this, but I always had that fear, you know, yeah. especially going in. Excuse me, especially growing up in a town or not really being related to any entrepreneurs that have like been able to do their own thing. So it's kind of hard to like just kind of go all in and lean on that. Yeah. Get rid of the um, safety paycheck. Yeah, that's coming. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because I always had that that thing with the brand where like I would drop something and it do really well or like I'd print a whole bunch of these and they wouldn't do well. And then it was just this constant battle. And that's why I kept having to go to work and not mm -hmm. working but go to work. So I would reinvest into the brand, but then I would keep doing that. And I think over time, um, I just I, oh, I started making my own clothes. And then that's how I ended up starting a printing company called Start Printing LA. And I was like, wait, if I'm making X amount for myself, 
why can't I do this for other clothing companies? You know what I mean? Yeah. So I literally, I'll, I'll tell you guys a straight up hack. I literally went to, shout out to Avant Space, by the way. That's I actually met him, the owner of that. He's really sure. cool. He lives in Utah. I think we were talking about him. But yeah, yep. um, I met him. But anyways, that was kind of full circle. But he basically posts like all these streetwear co- uh, companies. And he has an app where you can go to like, like a map, but it has like little pins of all the clothing brands that are on his app. Mm. And I literally went on the app and I clicked on all the clothing brands in LA and in like San Diego and like anywhere near LA, the Valley. And I literally just DM him, Hey, da 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 da. we offer these services. Da, 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 da. And I actually reached out to uh, like YouTubers and stuff like that. And even some pretty big ones, some like gave me a chance, let me do a couple of pieces for them. And then that relationship obviously got stronger and I would do things for them that other companies couldn't do. And then they were like, okay, well, maybe we'll let you do this next big thing. And so it just kind of kept leading on and building up upon that. And, uh, yeah, I started, started the printing company around the same time I got let go. So it was kind of like, it was kind of very transitional in a way. Yeah. Um, but COVID was still going on, so everything was still closed. And, uh, yeah, then that and uh, just being in COVID and thinking the world's going to end and all this yeah. stuff and all this crazy stuff happening with myself, like, introspectively and stuff, I... Um, decided to like kind of like I don't know if I really had a I guess I kind of had an ego death in a way but more so like with the brand I was like this was a great start it was like my baby you know but I need to I need to review things and and go in a different direction sure and we'll get to that how did you get to um, printing people's stuff did you buy a screen printing like forehead press thing did you buy sublimation like what it how did you build up to be even in a position to make the merchandise for people so i bought a heat press from amazon and i had a vinyl cutter i don't know why i don't know the name it it was like a cree cut it's like this little vinyl cutter port it's like 100 bucks yeah and basically i had that and my vinyl cutter broke and I called the place that I went to go get vinyl from. I said, hey, my vinyl cutter broke. Do you guys know anyone? Because they have a lot of small business owners that come in there all the time. Do you know anyone that can help me cut vinyl? They're like, oh, this guy, Koi, um, he can help you uh, cut this vinyl. And so I pulled up on the guy, and it was like, uh, I pulled up, and he was a really nice guy. He cut my vinyl. He was going to do it for free. I was like, no, like I gave him some money, obviously. And he was like, yeah, I'm actually getting this like direct-to-garment printer, and uh, oh, I'm thinking about getting this direct-to-garment printer next year. And this is now just trying to figure out like a partner situation or something. And I was still working at Honda, so I was making some decent money. And I ended up moving in with this like couple. I was paying like very cheap rent. So I was like, oh, well, we can maybe go in as partners and yada, yada, yada. He basically, we came up like this. We had a, we had basically like a part, a, a partnership in a way, but more so, I guess like a partnership, honestly. Sure. And uh, he ended up getting uh, the machine and uh, I had access to that. And then I also, uh, started to figure out how to screen print because he used to screen print so he, he honestly taught me a lot bro i love that guy he's given me so much game like i owe a lot to the, a lot to him i mean i took in the knowledge you know that he was giving but yeah. i was very like, he didn't have to tell me all that you know right and uh, he taught me basically how to do all the printing like all the different printing strategies i would just ask questions i would watch youtube videos um but since i had access or i was a partner with him on that dtg um, I was able to do like basically any job and I'd do sample work and small stuff just to get like the attention of people or like just show them like, hey, I could do this real quick. I could hop off of work at five o'clock, run to the shop, go print this, drive it all the way, to, drive it to Hollywood, West Hollywood, the Valley, Calabasas, wherever you need me to go. Like I'll do it and I'll do it for either cheap or like damn near free if it's like a cool, um, like if I, if I see the relationship developing. So um, I was just really hungry, man. And even if I didn't have access to the materials or to do it or to manufacture it, um, I found a way and I just found the way just from asking people. So if, yeah. so if like that guy quit, I didn't know anybody. I would just go to like the place I got my, my materials from. Hey, do you know anybody that could do this or this and that? And I've been able to develop a whole network and partnership literally just from asking. And yeah. like a lot of things that I've done and like these projects I've gotten for like TV shows, or, like these last minute things where these big companies can't do it, but I can. is just from me saying I can do it and then finding a way to do it. So yeah. I, I may not know the way or know how, but I, if, as long as I know the method and what needs to be done, I can find the way to do it. Yeah, I mean, that's problem solving. Yeah. When you own a business, you're going to have problems pop up all the time. You know, through my skateboard shop and stuff, that happens too. You don't have a boss. You don't have a dir- dir- you know district manager to call up and say, hey, I got this problem. I got to blah. You just have to figure it out. Mm-hmm. You know, so you develop that mentality. And I would say you'd be surprised. Well, I shouldn't. You wouldn't be surprised because you know this, but most people would be surprised if you actually work hard mm-hmm. and you are actually trying to do something cool and you have the right attitude, 
people will help you. Of course. Pretty often, people yeah, that you wouldn't think, even when they have nothing to really gain, of course. people want to help people who are like working hard. Of like, it happens all the time. It happens with the show, right? Mm -hmm. Where it's like, I'm genuinely really trying to create something really cool. The message is cool. I've had people that I don't really have much business interviewing, mm -hmm. at least earlier on, especially that like were way bigger than I would otherwise interview, you would think. And they're like, oh, no, I just like what you're doing. This is cool. Like, no problem. Tight, mm -hmm. you know? And that's it, is being willing to, like, be modest enough, humble enough to be like, okay, well, I don't know how to do this yet, but I'm going to figure it out. Mm -hmm. I need help, though. Is anyone willing to help? And people are going to be willing to help. You mentioned you've been able to do some really cool projects. I'm just interested. What are a couple of the cool, like, looking back, what are some of your favorite projects that you've gotten to do, whether it was, like, for a TV show or something? Um, so, yeah, I got the opportunity to do... Um, this thing for you know David Dobrik the YouTuber mm -hmm. yeah I did um he had this Dodgeball Thunderdome TV show and I got this really big job to do that which was really sick um I also was able to meet with um Travis Scott's um not designer I'm sorry a stylist uh, his stylist and I did some stuff for Cacti which was really really cool and then I also did through that connection as well he has this upcoming album called Utopia and I did this shirt like maybe like a year back and then uh, and Rolling Loud a couple years ago, or not, even, sorry, not a couple years, like maybe, maybe like six months ago, whatever Rolling Loud Miami was, they like turned into like that Kanye mask, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And uh, he wore it on stage. So that was really cool. Um, yeah, I've been able to work with like a whole bunch of cool companies and people that like I looked up to and just kind of just doing stuff like that, some cool streetwear brands. Um, but I'd say like the coolest thing for sure is working for Travis. Like I love Travis. I've, I mean, I know this, all this, whatever stuff is happening and it's very unfortunate, but I'm not a big fan of like the whole cancel culture thing. And at the end of the day, I mean, that could be a whole nother conversation. Sure. It was more so the event and like how they handled it and how it was set up. I mean, I don't, I don't know if he should take the whole pitfall cause I've been to a Travis concert and I know how he is and I don't know. It was, it was, it was just a crazy situation and obviously there's mixed opinions on it, but if I'm being completely transparent, it's like, in my honest opinion, it's like he's an artist and of course he's going to take the fall and the blame, but it's really, he's just the name on the, on the yeah. event. The event should have been put together better. It was put together super last minute. The lineup was like literally sent out like a week before. Like it just wasn't planned well. And obviously it's very, very unfortunate. It's very yeah. sad. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's it's uh, that's a whole nother conversation. Well, there's I mean, there's yeah. two sides to, course, to every story. And realistically, and I don't really know that much about it. I've seen the little news stories. News stories are always trying to point fingers at somebody. Yeah. But you're right. He was hired or his his job was to perform. His job was not security. Mm -hmm. His knob job was not to control the crowd. His job was to get people excited to watch the show. Everything else that was happening, there were a lot of people mm -hmm. involved. Of course. Those people collectively they it didn't get the job done. And that's what happened. But it wasn't I mean, come on now. It's not you're it's hard to put all the blame on an artist because he got people too excited. Yeah. You know, and and again, that may so I may piss some people off, and I can't say I really know what's going on, but of but course, all I'm course. saying is I agree with you that like, look, there's a lot more people than one person involved, and if he was aware in the moment that people were literally dying, yeah, there's no way that no. he would have then acted the way that he did. People, it just yeah, because people pass out. At, I've been to multiple right. Coachella. I've been to all these festivals, and like yeah. people pass out all the time. That doesn't mean they're dead. I mean, obviously, people do pass away, unfortunately, but it's like just from maybe drugs or whatever, but it's sure. like, like when you see someone passed out, like, I don't know. It's a whole nother conversation. It, yeah. like I and said, again, it's yeah. that there's security and there's yeah. other people within the event organizing that yeah. those responsibilities are really supposed to be on those people's shoulders, except those people aren't the name anyone would care to see in a headline. So they're not the people talked about anyways. It's anyway. a crazy world. Yeah. So Sorry. you yeah. let's get back to you. We're doing RKT mm -hmm. at some point you had a ego death of the brand anyways, where you saw, OK, well, this brand did what I wanted it to do. Right. Mm -hmm. It helped grow. This was where I started. So I have this like attachment to it emotionally. It got to help me grow through my own career. To a certain point and then you changed it right it's a whole new brand now do you want to talk about 369 yeah so um yeah i mean i kind of just went through some things internally understanding things about myself figuring out why i was making clothing the type of designs the pricing i was doing everything and i just wanted to see what more aligned with like what i wanted in the future you know and it just didn't seem like it aligned so um i kind of killed off the brand and i just kind of just started talking with friends and uh, I just realized I was doing RKT all by myself, and now with 369, I've developed a team, which has been amazing. And so now that I've been able to take kind of like the foundations of RKT and turn it into 369, and that in itself, 369 has like a lot of correlation to me as well. Like I was born on June 3rd, 99, and like 
three six nine have always been like this thing, and like I've had this necklace, this ohm necklace that's on my sunglasses and stuff. Um, I've had this chain since I was literally born. Like my grandparents gifted it to me, and the ohm is like apparently the first sound in the universe, and like uh, the ohm is actually like a variation of a three six nine. Like our logo literally is a three six nine, which looks like the ohm symbol. And there's just a lot of like things. Honestly, I don't. I'm not super knowledgeable, but there's a lot of uh, synchronicities and similarities with that. So I kind of just use that to develop 369. And even to this day, we're still developing. And I may even develop 369 into something else. I have no idea. But at this point in my life right now, that's what I feel most aligned to. And that's what I feel mo most that like, I want to bring that message or these, because to me, these numbers are good things. Like it's a good thing. It's not a bad, no negative connotation. I feel like a lot of brands even my old brand rkt like i made these dead inside shirts that sold like crazy but like there's always like this negative like dead like whatever type thing that's just not a positive narration and it might be good in a way because it's like oh like i'm representing like feelings that like i don't really show but at the same time i feel like i'm feeding energy into that so i yeah. i'm, I'm kind of trying to reverse that and um it's more internal as well as like looking cool and feeling good like i want to make cool products that look good and make people feel good but then also I'm, I'm i mean this is something that's still in the works i'm i'm developing products that are going to help with your mental health so like creating like a journal or like a this or that that are practices to make your life better more than just from a, a visual perspective yeah no i mean i think it's super important that's why like we look at the show right where it's like it's all a positivity thing it's about helping people in the world and really it's it's you either get in a, a negative downward cycle mm -hmm. or you get in a positive upward cycle. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like when you take money out of the factor and you take your ego out of the factor, which is impossible to a certain degree, you you got to look at like, okay, well, what are the actual cause and effects? Like what, what am I actually affecting? If I died tomorrow, what's the legacy I'm leaving behind? Is it helping people? Is it making the world better or is it making the world worse? And I wish that was a conversation that we had with kids even through schooling of like, this is something you should really think about because it's going to matter to you personally. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm curious at this point, uh, well, for one, how old is three, six, nine? How long ago was it that you started that? Honestly, man, I have to look at the Instagram. I think it was at the end of last year though. Wait, when did COVID hit? When did things shut down? March of 2020. Okay. Maybe it was like, oh, uh, maybe it was a little bit later. I think it was actually December, 2020. So almost a year. Gotcha. How what many? Uh -huh. okay. How many people are involved? You said you got like a team, right? Approximately uh, how many people are helping out with the process? Like six. And what what's your kind of role with it? Creative, Is it creative direction, manufacturing. Oh, okay. Are you doing the design work as well? Uh, yeah, but that I mm, to an extent. Some of it. I'm very good at conceptual like conceptualizing a lot, but when it comes mm. to actually putting to gra the graphics together, I have a pretty good understanding. Yeah. But if I have a designer kind of just give me the assets, I can put it together really well. Sure. Um, yeah. I mean, I got to get, that's one thing I wish I could get better at. Cause like I do have my own branding, right. Mm -hmm. Cause I got my own store. So I have mm -hmm. passion branded merch. Um, but I struggle a little bit with that. Like my artwork, I don't think translates into like a brand that well. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, that's like a whole nother thing I'm trying to work on. But so you got six people working on that. How much, if you had to guess like a percentage, just throw it out there, how much of your income or how much of your business is coming from outside, like manufacturing other people's stuff or working for other people? And how much of it is coming from 369? It varies every month. Sure, sure. <laughs> I feel like I'm like, my income kind of stays the same, like the range, but um, but like it'll be like maybe like 60% printing, 40% brand, sometimes it'll be 70% printing, 30% brand, sometimes it'll be 90% printing, 10% brand, other times it'll be 90% brand, 10% printing, and sure. I'm like kind of in this whole thing where I'm like going back and forth, um, so I need to honestly get a little bit better at that. I'm setting goals for the printing company and for the brand, but ideally 70% uh, printing, 30% brand, because sure. the printing company is like, I'm doing these big bulk jobs, you know what I mean? So. Um, it, I think it's easier to scale a little bit because if I land maybe two or three bigger clients on that end, I'm it, it can double my revenue sure. for a month. You know, so are you hiring people to do most of that legwork itself, mm -hmm. and you're just trying to secure the contracts? Yep, exactly. So That's now right. I've gotten to a point where I was doing a lot of the manufacturing myself, staying the late nights, going to work, wearing my work shirts to to there, sweating my eyes off, and going. Sorry, I, I'm just conscious about that. Yeah, um, and then I would uh, go like go to work. Get off work, go to work, 
maybe put on either wear the same clothes, maybe get time to go home and like take a quick, ha- quick shower yeah. and then, <laughs> and then, um, go back to it. But now I've found good people who can do my manufacturing and I've taught and trained and, um, and then I've like really shown like my ways. And so it's, uh, as far as manufacturing goes, I'm kind of hands off now. I, I I've shown and I've had staff who've made enough mistakes to where like they're pretty solid and I, I can put my, my faith in them as far as like actually doing the labor. Dude, it's hard to do. I mean, it's yeah. taken me, it's taken me all the way up until mm-hmm. now to have an employee that is like very consistently running my store for me. Mm-hmm. He's there more than I am. Yeah. Uh, my friend Mikey Selsky, he's mm-hmm. basically my general manager. I mean, so. I've gone in this last year, not including these last couple of trips, um, a few months ago, it had been like one calendar year. I took 15 trips of a week or longer, wow. one being three weeks, one being over a month. Wow. Or like, dude, I was not at my store very much yeah, for yeah. a solid year, mm-hmm. which there was a lot of things going on. I of went course. like I got divorced and I mm-hmm. was trying to kind of spend a little bit more time very like purposefully spending time out by myself, going mm-hmm. camping and doing different things, kind of figure out where I wanted to go with with whatever. But I was hardly around. And the only reason I was able to do that was because I finally found somebody that was like consistently, mm. you're going to be here for a long time. I can trust you with everything. Yeah, that's really hard to do. So I'm like, I'm just that's like, beautiful. I'm just praying that yeah. Mikey sticks around forever. So like, yeah. hopefully that works out the that's way. That's amazing. That's that, yeah. remember Ethan, you just met the yeah, kid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like my right hand man. I love that kid. Was, and he's so young too, man. He's like 18, 19 and he's going to be amazing. He's going to do great things. Yeah. He, I don't know if he knows it yet, but he's, he's has a lot of potential as a, and I'm definitely going to try to put him in the right track as much as I can, you know? Sure. Great sure. Kid. Love that guy. So what, I mean, where do you want things to go? Are you also actually one more thing? Mm-hmm. You're mostly, you were making t-shirts and stuff mm-hmm. um, and you do a lot of direct garment mm-hmm. things. Um, what is it that you offer that's different than other people on the manufacturing side? If somebody's like looking for somebody to make new stuff, like I got to have, mm-hmm. I don't know anyone that does direct garment printing. So mm-hmm. I actually I'm probably going to ask you about that. Sweet. Uh, but in general, like why would people want to hit up you specifically for that rather than like some, whatever you line or some other random website? Uh, I think because we're full service and I understand what people want. Like, I feel like a lot of these printing companies, they just like have an idea. They're like, oh, I can't do this. But really, you can, you can do anything, you know. Yeah. Um, and I think uh, we have so many different services. So, like, I have influencers I work with that are like, oh, there's just like one person, like maybe like a girl created an account for like her dog or something. And the dog's super popular and she may not know how to create like a like a stream of revenue for that. So, like, we'll help them develop merch or develop products for that. Um, I think offering basically full service to where the creator can create and we do all the legwork and all the background work i think that's what separates us from the um from the from the crowd we're not super expensive but we're not the cheapest you know sure and uh but our our our, our work is quality and we do everything so we'll take in the orders we'll ship it out directly to your customers um we'll work with you with on coming up with the color palette design website everything um basically everything and if we don't do it directly we will reach out to a partner or something and we will find a way to get it done for you yeah so i think that's what we have to offer i mean um, building that relationship else. is important yeah, of course the relationship is just as important as yeah. like whatever the cost is or anything else you of know course. what i mean and yeah. plus people will move more units because they're having that extra help of course yeah you know? and and that's why like even like right now we're kind of getting we're kind of in a position where we're trying to get to we're trying to basically, we believe in what we do and we've been able to replicate it so many times. So we're kind of trying to get in a way, in a position now to where we have an offer that's like basically, um, it's on both ends. It like holds us accountable, but then it also, uh, makes you strive for like a certain goal. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Of course. Um, so basically like creating an offer that's beneficial for both me and the person I'm working with. Yeah. Well, I've been um, trying to get to that point with like my yeah. show where mm-hmm. it's like, there's only so much I can personally of do course. with it. Mm-hmm. Right. So I have somebody that I pay to edit my show mm-hmm. and, and it's like, I, I know my show can get the, it's, it's certainly capable of doing more ad revenue. It's certainly capable of growing and getting bigger and bigger and bigger. At some point, though, I need some kind of management or some I need some people to help with things. Mm-hmm. And I'm willing to give a big percentage of anything that I make to somebody else if they're mm-hmm. taking all these other responsibilities of off my case. So mm-hmm. that way I can focus on creating. It's mm-hmm. just there's like so much more to it. What's your favorite thing you've ever made besides the glasses you're wearing that are like so <laughs> sick? Um, but what's your favorite thing that you've ever made? Man, every time I make something new, I think it's my favorite thing. Like every time I make something new, it's my like I made a shirt today. I'm well, I'm not wearing I can show the camera. But sure. I, have a, I have a shirt on under here that I made today, which is so sick. But I actually worked with the designer who did the Utopia Utopia merch for the Travis Scott thing. So I love that design. And I even did another one, which Ethan was wearing, which is a sick shirt. I have to show you when he gets back. Yeah. Every time I make something, it's like, this was my favorite thing. As soon as we made them, I was like, yo, these are so sick. 
these are glasses I don't even wear during the daytime. I like only wear these like at the club or like when I go out at night. Cause like in the daytime, yeah, they sparkle or whatever. But dude, at night it'll be like pitch black, and these things are like. And they're, they're a one of one, right? Um, no, so we have nine pairs. Um, oh, sick. They're, they're kind of expensive, but they're like really high quality. We use the same manufacturers that like a lot of designer um, brands use. So it's really high quality polarized lens, like super heavyweight. Rhinestones aren't going nowhere. Um, so Varsity crystals, like. Yeah. So yeah, it's like this is like honestly probably the nicest thing I've made. Like as far as like most it costs to make them, but then also just from like just like the whole process of manufacturing them. Um, but I mean, honestly, bro, every time I make a product, it's like my new favorite thing. Yeah. Um, depending on, I mean, obviously sometimes I make some things I'm like, eh, but then like there's some things I make and I'm like, yo, that's a sick idea. Like I'll have a vision. And then when I see it come to life and it looks like how I envisioned it, it's like, okay, that that's amazing. Dude, that happens with my paintings all the time too. Yeah. It's like every, the next thing I paint, I'm like, oh my God, this thing's so sick. Yep. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Or like, honestly, I was with the show too. It's mm -hmm. like, What's your favorite episode? Whatever was the most recent <laughs> one, then I'm like, that yeah. one was so good. So mm -hmm. like, I, I feel you there. Um, okay, so the direction of where things are going. So say three three months, six months, a year, whatever. What do you, what do you like? What are your goals? What are you like hoping to accomplish? What where is your life trying? What do you want your life to look like? So I'm not a big money. I mean, I kind of am a money guy, but not really. Like I've kind of gotten in a position to where. Like I really wanted like a Tesla. Like I, I've actually done podcasts before, and then that it's funny. I did a podcast maybe like two years ago, and I talked to this girl, and I was like, "Yeah, it'd be cool if I just had this and that." And I literally have those things. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's a, it's an amazing thing to see. It's like, yo, that's sick. Um, and I think anybody can do that. But um, <laughs> what was the question again? <laughs> so what, <laughs> what do you want your life to look like okay, in six yeah. months? What are you so hoping to do? So this is actually the question that I was asked. Um, back. Sorry, that's why I brought it up because yeah. I was asked that question. Like, what are you, what are you going to do in two, three years or whatever? And I, it's happened. So it's a beautiful thing. So I'm going to go ahead and try to affirm it again. <laughs> um, I'd say in the next three months, um, just have my company a little bit more operational. I have some positions that I want to fulfill as far as like, I'd say getting clients like inbound and outbound and stuff like that. Um, optimizing the flow. Um, and then also for the clothing, making cooler products, making products like the sunglasses, making products like cool pants shirts shoes things products that make people look and feel good um and i'd say like that's my goal in the next three months is just to maximize on that uh hit the company goals that i have in mind and um and yeah kind of be a little bit more hands off and transitioning into that within i'd say like three months to six months to a year i really want to kind of reduce you know whatever i'm spending here like personally like as far as la like rent all this this and that and I want to travel and I want to have the company going to where I can have the ability to travel. And I have a good person, a solid person that I can rely on out here to do a lot of the stuff and make sure they're being taken care of and fed well while I'm just kind of soaking in the world. Like I'm 22, going to be 23 next year. And I think I want to be in a position with things opening up. I, I want to go to Europe. I want to go to Tokyo. I want to go to China. I want to like, I want to go to these places. I want to indulge in their culture and indulge in the things on how they operate and how they move and, and incorporate that within my brand, within myself, within my thinking, just overall, just really travel. I've traveled, honestly, a lot. I've been very blessed to travel basically everywhere in the world, except for Africa. But um, I really want to go everywhere and like just and just be and embrace myself into these cultures. And uh, I'd say like that's my goal for the next couple of years is to be able to travel, not think about money, just have my solid roots in, in L.A. or yeah. Honestly, it's probably in LA. Just have solid roots in LA. Maybe have like a home base in LA. Um, have my company being run. Just things going well. Just I'm kind of more hands off, making sure my mom, dad, taken care of. You know, whatever. Um, but yeah, I'd say that that's my goal for the next couple of years. And then after that, probably coming back. Or, I mean, dude, I'm gonna be traveling the world. I might like somewhere else a little bit more. You know. Yeah. Um, settle down wherever I settle down, and um, probably just focus just enjoy life a little bit um whether if that's building a family or whatever i see see to be but um really just being um just being able to do whatever i want to do i think is what my next goal is and i think creating and honestly probably once i've done those things i'm gonna want to pass on that information and that knowledge and yeah. so whether if that's creating like I have a YouTube channel that has like a decent amount of viewers, whatever, but whether if that's like diving into YouTube, writing books, creating program, whatever it is, working with governments, reforming education, whatever it, it, it may be. Um, I think my goal after I get a lot of that out my system is for like, I'd say 
figuring out as, as soon as I get like the foundations down and I've traveled and I've done all that, I think trying to impact the world and the greater consciousness of like society and people would be my next goal. And whether if that risks me putting myself in a position to where I'm like not, you know what I mean? Where I can just say things that may be so out of the box that people may look at it weird or something. I think that, um, I'm willing to do that to at least get people to think a certain, think different, you know? Yeah. And, uh, at least putting the thought into someone's head, I think is, is, um, is my, is my, I think it's my life purpose, man. Honestly, um, at the end of the day, I think, I think there's a lot of people out there with a lot of potential and I've seen it go to waste. And, and that's like one of the hardest things that I've been able to, that I've seen as like growing up with kids that have so much potential and seeing that go to waste and just seeing that just kind of dissipate or disappear. Um, it's, it's heartbreaking, man. And honestly, man, if I'm being completely transparent, like I don't even, I love to go home to see my mom, but like, it's very sad to like see some people that like I grew up with that I knew have amazing capabilities and potentials and not seeing them live up to that. And like trying to talk to them and saying like, they're saying all this is not, but I'm like, bro, like you could literally do that. Like, I know you, like I grew up with you, like I've been around you. And, uh, I think just helping people realize what they have within them and, helping them take the steps to bring that into fruition. And I'm still in the process of figuring that out. But as I figure those things out, I definitely want to spread that, especially to the people I love. Yeah. And uh, I, I've definitely, I grew up an only child. I, I've, I've been alone a lot of my life and I feel like I've learned a lot and I've dealt with a lot and I've dealt with people just talk. I mean, I've had good experiences with people. I've had a lot of love in my life, but I've also had people try to really bring me down and really make me, either feel a certain way or seem a certain way when I'm really not. And I've had to learn to deal with that and not take it personal and just use that as not really fuel, but just, kind of, yeah, I guess fuel in a way. Um, but, but not really giving them that energy at the same time. So yeah. I know that's a lot. No, no, I'm, yeah, I feel you. Yeah, I mean, yeah. there's a, there's a few things there, right? Number one, we talked about it earlier. Mm -hmm. It's about getting people to do that first step because you get that momentum moving mm -hmm. and then their potential can be realized. The mm -hmm. problem is, is they're standing their own way because they're mm -hmm. nervous about it. They can't take that first step. So the show is definitely the way that I'm attempting to do that in that kind of way. And I think the way you were talking about, um, you know, what you're trying to do, I kind of have my own way of saying it that's relatively brief. People ask me, what are your goals? Because I've been getting interviewed a lot around my hometown for some stuff. And my my answer is, I want to be financially free to create. Mm -hmm. That's it. Mm -hmm. I just don't want limitations in my way. Of course. I want to be able to create whatever I want to create, whether it's more episodes of the show, whether it's, you know, you know, apparel things, or if I want to do YouTube or something or whatever. I just don't want money to be what's dictating the things that I do. And, it, and it's slowly not you know being an issue for me thankfully so everything's kind of moving in the right direction i'm a bit older than you um i'm established in my own kind of rights doing my own kind of thing um but i am getting to the point where i can create a little bit more freely i have i have different you know streams of revenue i make money off my artwork i make mm -hmm. money off the show off my shop so i can kind of spend my time doing it how i want to do it and my goal is my kids are five and eight i'll be 45 when they graduate and they move out mm -hmm. my goal is to semi-retire at 45 and amazing. then just like yeah. chill you know what i mean which I, I know myself business mind i'll always want to be involved in stuff but i'm hoping at that point i can be totally hands off mm -hmm. um and just you know paint and, and kind of do whatever we're getting towards the end of the show there's always two questions i know we've been going for a little bit but i just i really want to know because i'm sure you have some really cool stories and like it's my favorite thing to ask uh -huh. what is a story that you can tell us something about something that you're really grateful for some experience that you had um but it only happened because you chose this path That's such a tough question, man. <laughs> I've had so many things in my life to where I've been so grateful. And it's actually crazy because some of the most, some of the things that have happened in my life that at the time seem like the most terrible thing and like world shaking things have actually been some of the most beautiful things that have happened that have made me realize a lot of beautiful things internally, you know? Um, I can't honestly say one story off the top, but one thing I could say is, um, is I, I just think that if you go with your gut and you follow your heart and it sounds corny and whatever, but it's true. I think if you follow your gut instinct and you follow your heart and you block out fear, you're able to realize a lot of these things that you're capable of or things that, um, like these situations that can happen, but it can just show you another Thing. like I've I, okay I'll give this story actually when I moved out here 
I'm not going to say his name, but there was a guy who I met who was a very wealthy guy and he wanted to invest in my company and this, this and that. And I became very close with him and um, I still got love for him. We actually were still friends to this day. But um, I mean, things happened with what he was trying to invest in that didn't work out and just some other things like his relationship. And I just saw like, like I lived, like I enjoyed, like I saw like a whole nother paradigm of like money and like this and that and this and that. And it was beautiful. It was awesome. It, it opened my mind to like, that's, that's like, that's a thing. Like these sprinter vans with like this and that and like clubs and this, like these are real things, you know? So it opened my paradigm to that. But then it also showed me that like, if I get these things, like how, like, I could be like that and I could be in these positions where I could start doing this or that. That's just not a good thing. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um, that could, you know, make me, you know, whatever, you know what I mean? Just not a good person, not going on the right path. Cause I'm so indulged in, uh, money and this and that, and this and that materialistic things or, ex you know what I mean? Just it gave like, you a perspective on all it of gave it. me a great perspective and especially seeing him and how I know he's a great person. Like he has a great heart. He's an amazing guy. And I think I have a decent heart. Like I knew he cares about people and I know I care about people and I could see how that could, like I could see a lot of myself in him and seeing that happen and seeing how that kind of played out. And obviously he's okay now, thankfully, um, seeing how that played out and he's actually on this come up. He's, he's getting back to who he is and sure. hopefully he continues to go down the good path that he's been kind of going on. But, um, seeing that firsthand was definitely, um, something that was I'm, I'm very grateful for is just seeing those experiences and seeing how he operated and, and it kind of showed me a way that it kind of just told me like yo like where are your values aligned is it aligned with this flashy lifestyle whatever where you're spending all this money and then maybe making it back because you have a good month in business or whatever or is it like or is it within something else you know i mean it comes back to when you're talking about traveling right mm -hmm. it's when you see and you experience other cultures but it's when you see other people's mm -hmm. lifestyles or anything when you can see that t type of thing firsthand that really helps you gain a perspective with you in your own life and then mm -hmm. it allows you to kind of self reflect and go okay well this that that thing didn't make this person happy mm -hmm. that didn't actually help him get towards this that thing affected him in this way mm -hmm. when you can see it firsthand it really is beneficial 100%. Uh, really is beneficial to you. Um, really, we're at the end of the show. I think that was a great lesson to kind of leave on. Mm -hmm. How can people best support you moving forward now that they've listened to the show? Obviously, they're like going to go check out your profile and stuff. But in general, like people want to help you get to this next level of your life. How can people best support you? Um, so, I mean, you can get me on Instagram at Rohan K. Taylor or um, my brand is at 369 Los Angeles. And then if you want to need anything printed anywhere in the world, um, it's Star Printing LA at Star Printing LA. And you can just DM us on all those. I mean, there's forms and stuff you can type in as well, but honestly, Instagram's probably the easiest way just sure. to reach out directly. Yeah, Instagram's the easiest way for me to passion yeah. pod. Um, and for us, for the show, sharing the show, you know, Patreon, there is a of Patreon course. for the show. If you just go passionpod.org, you can find merchandise and all kinds of stuff that clearly, you know, we have to work on. And I didn't mean to cut you off. What, what were you gonna say? I don't think I was going to say anything. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, the easiest way really, like there, there's financial, obviously money is a very, very helpful tool. It's not the only mm -hmm. tool to get to success to the, the things that you're trying to achieve, but it is a helpful one. So purchasing merchandise off my website, purchasing merchandise off yours. Um, but otherwise you can just subscribe to the things that we do. Like that's always helpful. Sharing stuff. If you know somebody that may benefit from this episode of the show, or if you know somebody that has a business or someone who's trying to get something off the ground where they're like, they got these designs they want printed. They can hit you up that way. I mean, there's a lot of ways to kind of support things. Thank you for joining us for this episode of The Passion Pod. We hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. We'll see you soon. <laughs>